So for today, we're going to be in Galatians chapter 5. If you have your Bibles and want to turn to Galatians 5 with me, um, we're going to look at some other passages, but that's where we're going to be for the majority of the time. Um, And, you know, I'll just digress for one minute. Um, When I started just the week after Easter, uh, we we talked about the goodness of God, and we looked in Romans about what the kingdom of God is. And then last week, uh, we talked about what rest is, what, what is discipleship, what is formation, what, what are these things, and how do we enter into the eternal rest that Jesus is offering? And without trying to, this kind of could be its own series um, as we look at really what is the life that we are invited to live in every day as we partake of what Jesus has offered. And today is kind of almost piggybacking off of the last two weeks. Um, and if you weren't here for those last two weeks, I'd really encourage you to go back and listen to those. You can listen to them online. You can check them out on YouTube or Facebook. But I want to start with a couple questions. And the first question is this. How many of you would say that you feel currently, despite your best efforts, best intentions, that you're not really growing in your relationship with the Lord? Don't have to raise your hand. Just want you to ask yourself that question. And rather than each year being a marker to say, you know, I've grown in this area and this area this year. Where, where I wasn't there last year. And each year, just being another marker of saying, God, you have challenged me here and here. And two years ago, you challenged me there and there. And every year, just seeing growth, maybe it feels instead like the more time that passes by, you just feel more and more stuck. You just feel more stagnant. And, and maybe your, your connection to God has been so waning that, that maybe you're struggling with depression. Maybe you're struggling with all these things. And what I like to tell people is depression often is, is a first telltale sign of the fact that we are trying to fill the, a hole that only God can with all sorts of other stuff. We can, we can really end up very depressed if we're looking for fulfillment in all of these places that really can't offer it. And if this is the type of experience that you would say is descriptive of your life, or it's something that you're experiencing off and on. Maybe your spiritual life has just looked like, you know, a a roller coaster. It's up really high and down really low all the time. Then we have to ask some questions. We have to determine, you know, why are we living this way? Because that's not necessarily the life that God has called us to. That's not necessarily what God has in mind for his best. So today we're going to look at those experiences. And we're hopefully going to discover why we can have years and years and years go by without growing in our character. Years and years and years go by without more spiritual fruit, without more maturity. Why the things that we've sold ourselves out to maybe don't seem to be producing the fruit that we'd like to see in our lives. We're going to discover why we live stuck despite trying really hard. So I want you to look with me at Galatians 5. We're going to start in verse 22 through 26. Well-known passage of scripture here. Paul says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit, leading in every part of our lives. Catch that. Every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. I really love um, to cook. It's, it's something that over the last couple of years I've discovered it's a passion of mine. I, I really, I started cooking out of necessity. Um, my wife will tell you, you know, cooking, she just, it's not something she enjoys. She will do it to provide for, you know, put dinner on the table, but it's not something she enjoys. And so I was like, you know what, I'll try it. And, and as I did, I really started to find it was, uh, it was something I enjoyed. And as I started cooking more and more, there was a lesson that, that I learned. And the lesson was when it comes to the importance of taking inventory of what you have in your kitchen. Because when I first started really, you know, moving past just basic meals and started experimenting, you know, I needed a lot more ingredients for, for the different meals I was making. So I was like, I, I, I'm taking, I mean, in my mind, I'm like, I know I have this, I have that, I have this, I have that. And, and I'd make this mental note, I'd go to the store, I'd get what I thought I needed, 
only to come home and find out I, I, my, my inventory in my mind was completely different than what I actually had in my pantry. So I was either having way too much of one ingredient or not enough of another, and then, you know, my dish wouldn't turn out and I'd be frustrated. And, but, but the whole point is this. I, I believe this principle of taking inventory is one of the greatest reasons that we experience spiritual imbalance in our lives. We don't take inventory of what's going on within our souls. We're, what are the fruits that are currently being developed in your life? And fruit isn't necessarily just the good stuff. Fruit, we're all bearing fruit. Every single one of us, we're bearing fruit right now. Now, what are the areas of lack that we have serious deficiency in right now? And we need grace to grow. Unfortunately, sometimes it takes an extreme event, something really, really tough in our lives for us to slow down and take stock. What, what, what am I doing with my life? What's going on in me? We, we take stock of these milestone moments that, that make us catch our breath and say, Lord, what, what's going on? Maybe it's explosive anger that reveals how impatient of, as people we are. Maybe it's just constant worry, just this nagging, throbbing anxiety that, that reveals how peaceless we live. Maybe it's depression. It shows how little joy we have that's radiating from our lives into the lives of others. Maybe it's coldness towards others, showing our lack of love for people. There are a lot of reasons why I believe we can settle into this place of not taking stock of where we are, of living spiritually fruitless and in multiple areas of our lives and ultimately never growing out of the patterns of our flesh. But as we just read, God has given us his own spirit. That changes everything. The Holy Spirit has promised to produce in us. And catch that, he will produce the fruit in you as the character, the likeness of Christ will come into fruition, but we have to partner with him in it. We have to work with him. We have to remain teachable by him. That is what keeping in step with the Spirit is. We often receive uh, directions like a cadet from a general, right? All right, go take the field. And we go, aye, aye. And we run and we try to just do it all on our own. And then we fail. We come back. And we're like, I, I. no, God wants you to do life in step with him. Meaning that when he takes a step, you, you mimic that step. When he moves this way, you move that way. It's not get all hyped up in church, woo, and then run off and conquer the world. No, it's doing every moment, every day with God, as we've been talking about the last few weeks. So this morning, what, what I want to do is I want to look at how, how can we better do that? How can we live each moment with God? How can we take stock of what's in our lives and respond with the fruit of the Spirit, rather than the deeds of our flesh. So, in order to do that, we have to take stock of what's in our soul, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna start with this. Um, you know, there's there's so much that we could talk about in Galatians five. Um, there's a lot of things that we could camp out. We could do a long series in, the, in just you know the book of the chapter of Galatians five. But this morning, I just want to I want to touch on three major snags that as I as I read this passage, I really think these three snags can keep us from the, the fruit that the Holy Spirit of God wants to develop inside of each and every one of us, flow out of our lives. So the first is this. The first thing that can snag us and keep us from the spiritual fruit that God is offering is misaligned priorities. Misaligned priorities. Um, a little, little over five years ago, my wife and I decided, you know what, let's get a puppy. We had been married, um, you know, a little less than a year, and, you know, we had a studio apartment, and Life was, you know, we, we, had, we had room in our lives. So we're like, let's get a puppy. And I've always been an animal lover. Um, and Riley's always been a, a great pet. Um, so fast forward a couple years, we have Riley. She's great. We love her. Um, then, th you know, three years ago, we had our first daughter, Mackenzie. And um, to say that since then, my dog Riley has become less important is like the understatement of the century, right? Um, so I love that dog. But at times I felt a lot of guilt for that dog because having two small girls right now, by the end of the day, there's just not a whole lot of energy left for the poor little dog. So I, 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 sometimes I'm just laying there half dead throwing an animal and she goes and gets it. But 
Um, you know, I feel guilty. I do. I feel guilty for the dog. But then I get over it. I really. And I get over it really, really quickly, okay? And I'll tell you why. Because while the dog does mean a lot to me, my daughters just mean so much infinitely more than that dog. Um, they're so much more important. They're so much more worthy of my time, my effort, my energy, my focus and attention. So the point is this. Sometimes the only thing that makes a good thing less important in your life is when God introduces an even greater thing into our lives. And as Christ followers, we too can get all too distracted, all too focused on something good, but maybe it's not the greatest thing that's deserving our attention. And what I would suggest to us this morning is that one of those things that we often get fixated on is what I will call, you know, we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit, right? So rather than maybe being focused on the fruit of the Spirit, we get too distracted by the excitement of the Spirit. And what do I mean by the excitement of the Spirit? What, I, what I'm talking about is the excitement that should happen, the excitement that naturally happens when we see God start to move in the ways that only he can. Maybe it's just very, very special worship moments that you're having with God, where you're sensing his presence, you're, you're overwhelmed with emotion, and you're just feeling very strongly his presence with you. Maybe it's, you know, God, God speaking to you or to someone else through a word of knowledge, through something prophetic. Maybe it's a miraculous healing taking place. Maybe it's a challenging message or sermon that is stirring things within you. Now, each of those things that I described, they're unique gifts of grace. They're things that God has given us for a reason. But time and time again, I really do feel as though as believers, we have a hard time prioritizing being over doing. We want to focus on the doing part because that's what lights us up. But God has said, yeah, the doing will come after you just focus on who you are. What you do is important, but who you are is so much more important. I've seen well-intentioned Christians become what I would call spiritual thrill seekers. They're always looking for the next moment, the next power encounter, the next conference, the next miracle, the next this, the next that. All the while, ignoring the very clear areas of brokenness and lack in their lives that God wants to transform, but they're too busy looking elsewhere. It's as though our expectation maybe has become that the miraculous can just bail us out from responsibility in the day to day, in the moment by moment life. There's nothing wrong, guys, with getting excited about what God is doing. God wants us to get excited about the things he's doing. But when that excitement becomes more important than becoming who God has made us to be, then it's a problem. This ordering, by the way, it's not, it's not my opinion. Let's look at this clear arrangement in Scripture. This is 1 Corinthians 13, 3 and 5. I'm sorry, it's not, it's not 3 and 5, it's 8 and 9. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 and 9. It says, prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge, all these gifts of the Spirit, will become useless, but love will last forever. Now, our knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become what? Useless. The truth of what Paul is getting at is clarifying what is temporal versus what is eternal. Now, the, the, the gifts of the Spirit, we've talked about those a lot over the last couple of years. And they are important. They are gifts that God gives the church to see the ministry and edification of his body come into fruition, to reach people, to, to actually be the people he's called us to be. But there will come a point where we will not need those gifts anymore. Why? Because we will all have unprecedented access to the throne of God together in community. So God uses spiritual gifts now because they're necessary, but there will come a time when they won't be. And notice what isn't temporary, by the way. Notice what is eternal love. Love, the greatest gift of the Spirit. And we have to prioritize that correctly. We can't get so wrapped up in the good things, again, that, that we miss out on the greatest things. So that whole misaligned priorities. We need to be focused as God's people more on who we are 
than what we do. Because we often just try to fix being issues with activity, okay? And God's saying, listen, activity will flow out of being. But how do we change? We talked about it last week. Daily life with God. We're being formed all the time, all the time by the things we're doing, by the things we're giving ourselves to, by the way we spend our time, real clock time. So misaligned priorities can, can threaten our ability to live out the fruit God wants to give us. The second thing that I believe can, we see in Scripture here that can really rob us of, of what God wants to do in our lives is unrealistic expectations. Okay, so misaligned priorities, and secondly, unrealistic expectations. Um, when I was a kid, I was looking for ways to make money, as a lot of 12-year-old kids were. And uh, being a 12-year-old, there's not a lot of skills I had. You know, just to be honest, there's not, not a lot of things I could do. So my dad gave me an idea. You know, we lived in a suburban neighborhood, and he said, why don't you mow some grass? You know, start up a little lawnmower business and make you up some cards. And so I started doing that. I started surveying the whole neighborhood, and I started, you know, I had two lawns and three, then four. And then, um, you know, and I was making you know, $20, $25 a lawn. It wasn't much. And um, then my dad came to me and he had a contractor friend that was in our church and he was going to be turning one of the vacant lots in our neighborhood into a new development. And this thing had been sitting there for years. So um, as a 12 year old, the grass was taller than I was. Um, But he's like, hey man, I don't want to deal with this. I'll give your kid a hundred bucks if he's willing to go knock it down. And a hundred bucks to a 12 year old, and that's like winning the lottery. So I, I didn't really even hear many of the details. I just heard $100, and I was like, I'm in. Um, so I take my cheap, beaten-down little lawnmower over there, wheeling it through the neighborhood. And I get to this lot, and I'm like, are you kidding me? Um, and I don't know if you've ever seen someone mow the lawn with the, you know, the, the bars down here, because I was just trying to not choke out the mower, but it didn't work. Um, so I spent all day weed eating that that lawn with one of those little electric weed eaters that was just, you know, no good. Um, And I eventually got the money, but let me tell you, it was a frustrating agreement. And, uh, you know, just thinking about that story, thinking about the the details that surround it, to me, it's a really good picture of how we often approach the Christian life. Um, You know, we look at all that's to be had, all that God wants to do in us, the beauty of life in Christ. And we say, man, I want that. I really do. I, I want that. And we start going after it. And we're excited. And then we get, we get in the thick of it. And we feel like life is choking us out. And we feel lost. And we feel like this isn't what I signed up for, man. And, and we, we keep going and we keep struggling. Perhaps what we have expected isn't realistic. You know, it wasn't fair for me to expect out of that little mower to be able to mow that yard. It was not a realistic expectation, so to speak. In the same way, it's not fair or reasonable to expect that you can become the person you want to be on your own through good intentions, through working hard. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 11 says this, Solomon, the wisest man who's ever lived, For everything, there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to turn away, a time to search and a time to quit searching, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be quiet and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What do people really get for all their work? I've seen the burden God has placed on us all, yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. Now, I believe most believers have a hard time reading that passage and accepting it at face value as truth. Is there really a time, is is there really beauty in times of grief, in times of searching, in times of throwing away, tearing down, death, etc.? Well, according to Scripture, there is. The problem arises when we, as the people of God, refuse to accept those seasons 
And instead, we, we, we just say, it's not happening to me. I'm going to get through this. I'm the, I'm the head, not the tail. I'm above, not beneath. We, we just refuse to accept that this is what reality is right now. And instead of embracing them and realizing that we can, in fact, find God in those seasons, we pretend they're not happening. We ignore them. We pretend like it, these things aren't, aren't discouraging us, that we're not experiencing them at all. It's almost like we've expected that our whole life in Christ can just be one long season of continuous harvest. Now, if that's your expectation, if that's what you're expecting, life in, that, that a good Christian is just constantly growing every single day, that every day is great, then you're going to feel like you're the oddball you're going to feel like everyone else has it together. What's wrong with me? Instead of seeing that that's not what Scripture reveals, when we finally settle on the fact that God's fruit, it comes to us in seasons, just like we see around us, we're free then to find God in all stages of life. Instead of feeling like we're losing at our spirituality, unless there's this constant positivity, this constant everything's great. So again, if we, if we have our priorities wrong, we'll miss out on the fruit God's offering us. If we have unrealistic expectations, then we're going to constantly feel like we're losing. Lastly, the third thing that I really believe can keep us from living in what God is offering to us in terms of spiritual fruit is an obstructed soul. And I've told this story before. It was just too, too good. When I, when I was a teenager, my, um, yeah, but laugh. My three brothers and I, we shared um, a bathroom. So it was like our main, our main floor. Um, my parents and my oldest brother lived on, and then me and uh, my two other brothers, we shared the basement. And uh, there was one bathroom down there, three teenage guys, like 17, 15, 14, all sharing one bathroom. You can imagine how that place was, right? Um, and, you know, the hardest part of the whole ordeal was really just decided when it came to cleaning, I mean, really what you had was like a second cold war. It was like everybody waiting back and just seeing how filthy can this thing get before someone volunteers to go and clean this disgusting bathroom. Um, and I remember, you know, the worst part was a shower. So we would be showering and by the end of the shower, you'd have like water up to your ankles because the drain just needed to be cleaned out. And uh, one day my dad went down there and he saw like this still water in the bathtub. He was like, what in the world is this? Um, you guys are slobs. So we went and bought this special drain. It was a zip it uh, clog remover, right? And he handed it to us. He said, go to town. I want that thing clean today. So we went in there and let me just tell you what came out of that drain was ungodly. I mean, it was, it was gross. It was, it was horrible. Um, and, and after that, you know, we began to realize, you know, it didn't really bother us until we had something different, that the water was just sitting around our ankles. But once it wasn't there anymore, we realized how crummy an experience that, that really was. And that's the same experience many of us have in our minds. And the same experience that many of us have in our souls. We've grown so accustomed to living with obstructions. Obstructions that are lodged within places in our heart. They're lodged within places of our soul, and they're keeping us from experiencing life the way God designed us to. And we don't even realize anything's wrong. But let me tell you, when God comes out and he cleans those things away, and he begins to restore to us the heart, the mind, the soul that he designed for you to have, then you begin to realize, whoa, I didn't even realize the stuff I was living with. We've grown way too accustomed to this. And 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4 reveals something about this. It says, By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We've received all of this by coming to know him. Please, please listen to this. We've received everything. What is he talking about? Everything we need for a godly life by coming to know him. Not by working really hard for it. Not by doing all of the right Christian practices, but by knowing him, doing life with him. The one who's called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises 
that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. God has given you every single thing that you need in order to live the life that he has said you can. He has given it to you by and through the Holy Spirit to live this godly life, this this fulfilling life that you were made for. But when our soul is obstructed with sin, when our soul is obstructed with pain and wounds and so on, instead of experiencing the fruits of the Spirit that we read about in Galatians 5, we experience different things. Things like yelling at our kids. Things like, you know, constantly worrying about finance, being impatient with our spouses, seeking revenge on those who've wronged us, and refusing to apologize, refusing to take ownership over the things that we do and instead to point the finger on and on and on. Now, what I think is interesting is that those different, those different actions, they actually reveal something about our soul more than they do anyone else's actions. They reveal our areas of immaturity and brokenness and the need that we have for the Spirit. But again, if it were that simple, we, we wouldn't have this issue. We're stubborn, right? As people, we are stubborn, and we make excuses for our behavior based on a number of different things. I think there's probably two major ones. I think other people is a big excuse. You know, we, we say things like, well, that person is just toxic. You know, I, I can't be around them. They're, they're just selfish or impossible or whatever word you'd like to fill in the blank with. And I can't begin to tell you how many times I've heard people say, well, I've just decided to get rid of the toxic people in my life. I'm just, I'm just not going to talk to them. I'm not going to interact with them. I'm not going to do any of that. Um, well, here's the problem. If you have a Facebook account, you have toxic people in your life, okay? If you have any form of social media, you have toxic people in your life. And... I think that Jesus can shed some light on this too. Jesus was no exception. He went through his entire ministry dealing with toxic people, dealing with the toxicity of the Pharisees. Every time he would go to do something, he's loving on people, he's healing them, he's he's giving them truth, he's, he's reshaping reality for them. And at every juncture, the Pharisees are there saying, who do you, what do you think you're doing? You know, getting up in his face, telling him, how dare you do this? And, and go on and on and on. But what did Jesus do? How did Jesus respond to toxic people with the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, so on. The people that we can't stand, the people that are driving us nuts, they actually reveal the hatred in our hearts. They reveal the sin and the depravity of our own souls. Instead of trying to remove these people from our lives, and that would just mask the problem we're better off to let the Holy Spirit deal with those things. You know, Lord, I am really struggling with rage towards this person. Even if I'm not acting on it inside of me, I am tore up about this. And letting him unpack that with you, rather than just saying, I'm not going to be angry, I'm not going to be angry. And then we blow up because we're not dealing with it. So we blame other people. And if we can't blame other people, then we blame our circumstances. And we overact, we overreact, we scream. And, you know, I'll tell this very quickly, but I I remember being a new dad. And I remember, um, you know, everyone, I know people always have good intentions, but everyone, you know, they would always say, oh, you're not ready for what's coming, you know? And it really bothered me because I was like, well, I'm as ready as I know how to be, right? Um, But I wasn't ready, okay? And, And, you know, having a newborn and, you know, being up all night and then having to go to work, all day, and then coming home and being up all night and having to go work all day. Just that cycle, it it is debilitating. Um, And I remember, you know, preparing myself for that and saying, you know, Nathan, just like pep talk, be a good husband, be a good dad, be a good pastor, be be good, you know, do do these things. And, And the pep talk worked for about three weeks, right? Week three of no sleep, let me tell you, Mount Vesuvius started like bubbling And my sweet wife, who, you know, was doing all of this stuff, would wake up and she'd be like, Nathan, can you please change that diaper? And I would start to get snappy. And I would start to be like, oh, my God, and grumble and complain and all sorts of stuff. And, you know, the thing for me was I started saying stuff like, you know what? This is normal. 
I haven't slept in three weeks. People who don't sleep in three weeks are irritable. This is normal. And I started making excuses in the circumstance, but then the Holy Spirit convicted me. He said, Nathan, do you want to be normal or do you want to be like Jesus? I want to be like Jesus. I don't want to be normal. So these excuses that I was making, they just weren't sufficient. They weren't okay. And after more and more time goes on, we, we have to realize that we don't. We don't have excuses. We aren't to be normal people. We are to be like the Lord. So we can't blame other people and we can't blame our circumstances. We have to look inside. We have to look inward into our own souls. And we start by reading these fruits of the Spirit. These are the things God has called us to. But as we come to a close, this is the most important thing we're going to talk about this morning. I want to go back. We started reading Galatians 5 at one point. I want to go back to the verses immediately preceding what we opened with. This is right before Galatians 5, 16 through 18. Paul says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you're not free to carry out your own good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. If we don't learn how to let the Holy Spirit guide our lives, then none of what we will have discussed will amount to anything. We will just continue to strive for change because we can, we can align our priorities. You know, we, we can begin to let God deal with some of these obstructions within our soul. We can begin to deal with our expectations about what life is supposed to be like. But again, if the Holy Spirit isn't the thrust behind those things, if the direction of where those, those efforts are headed are not guided by the Holy Spirit, then again, we're back to square one. We're just trying really hard, okay? Now, as we just read, we are not free to carry out our own good intentions. That's what Paul literally says. You are not free to carry out your own good intentions. But what we do read in, in terms of good news is that the key to walking in the Spirit, the, being guided by the Spirit is trusting Him to provide for us what we can't provide on our own. You know, I think I think that life in the Spirit is a lot like those um, bowling bumper things. Have you ever? Are you, are you bad at bowling like me? Anybody horrible at bowling like me? Yeah, praise God for the bumpers, right? I'm like, here's going to be a strike, and it's like off to the you know the wall. But those bumpers, man, they're like, nope, back to the middle. Nope, back to the middle. Nope, back to the and where it would be a gutter ball, I might knock down a pen or two, okay? And listen, you're not going to be perfect. But where a lot of times our lives would just end up in the gutter, if we were doing it on our own, with the direction of the Holy Spirit, we're able to go where he's guiding us. We're able to accomplish more than we ever could in our own strength. So we have to resolve to align these priorities, to change our expectations. We have to clear out the debris that's been lodged in our souls. But most importantly, we have to start realizing that life in the Spirit is exactly what we talked about last week. It is doing everything with God. And the second we start heading towards the gutter, the Holy Spirit's saying, don't do that. Okay. And we come over here. Listen, that's a bad choice. Let's calm down. Let's think about that. Okay. We come back to the center. That's what life with Christ is supposed to be. That's what life in the Spirit is about. So if we're really going to grow, if we're really going to have more fruit, more things like peace, joy, love, all of these fruits of the Spirit, if we're really going to become like Christ, we don't just have to apply some, some principles. It's a total upheaval, how we do life. We have to embrace a new framework of who the Holy Spirit is and, and, and what he wants to do in us and through us. And it's only then that the fruit that he's offering will become normal for us in our hearts and in our souls. As we come to a close here, I just want to, um, I really want to give you a few different areas to just do business with God. You know, I, I, I will say this, as I've just been sharing with you guys this morning, I, 
the last thing I really want to say is this. I think that all too often we have this, this misguided approach in our lives where we think that if we're not blowing up in anger, if we're not actively, you know, living in, in anxiety, if we're not having any of these, these other fruits that, that come, then we're living in the fruits of the Spirit. If, basically, if there's not negative emotion, if there's not negative action, if there's not sinful behavior, then I've got the fruits of the Spirit. I've got, I've got that. But really, we don't realize what's in us until something doesn't go our way. We don't realize what fruit is in us until the rug is pulled out from underneath us in life. And that's when we see what, what fruit is growing, on, growing in our hearts. God wants to help us with this. So I, I want to ask you a couple of questions. I want to let you just respond with the Lord and let him just, just challenge you this morning. Maybe today you're realizing that you've been living with misaligned priorities. Maybe you today you need to replace a good thing with a greater thing. Maybe you've been focused on some of the exciting things that God maybe spoke to you, things that he wants to do, and those are great. It's nothing wrong with that. But if we're not taking seriously the what we would call mundane patterns in our lives, then we're going to miss out on being because we're just so busy doing. Secondly, maybe you're realizing today that, that you have some unrealistic expectations. Maybe, maybe God, more than trying to just constantly overcome right now, maybe God's calling you to embrace the season you're in and find him in it. Maybe you're grieving right now. Maybe you, rather than trying to pretend you're, you don't need to grieve, maybe you need to embrace that grief and find God in it so he can bring you out of it. God can't help us if we're not honest with him. Maybe you realize that you're living with an obstruction. Maybe there's something in you that's been lodged in there and you've grown so used to it that you're not even aware of it. Ask the Holy Spirit. He, he will reveal those things to you. Allow the Spirit to reveal what, what's been keeping me from, from peace. What's been keeping me from joy? What's been keeping me from the fruit you're offering, Lord? And then give those things to him. Allow him to dislodge it in, in only the way he can. And lastly, maybe, maybe you're here and you're realizing your, your need to receive the Spirit's direction in life. And that's not like going to a map, pulling it out, pinpointing your location and saying, oh, here I go, and, that, and then putting it away until you get lost again. It's the voice of the GPS. You just made a wrong turn. Turn around right now. You, you should have gone here and you went there. It's having every moment of every day being guided by the God who loves you. So God, we come to you, and no matter what the needs are today, I don't know them all. I don't know what my brothers and sisters need today. I don't know what, what they're responding to internally, but Lord, I do pray that we would be people who are intentional about discovering what is the fruit in my life. What are you trying to do in me, Lord, that, you know what, I can't do on my own. And Lord, may we be teachable people. May we be people who are, are, are recognizing that the fruit you're offering to us, it's, it's life-changing. It's peace where there's anxiety. It is joy where there's depression. It is love where there is hatred. That is something only you can do. So Lord, we give you all of these things and we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can you give him praise this morning?